I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. During the January 6th committee's second public hearing on Monday morning, former top Fox News editor Chris Steyerwalt spoke about election night 2020. California Democrat Zoe Lofgren asked him about Fox News calling Arizona for Joe Biden, a call that occurred prior to other major news outlets. Steyerwalt, who is no longer employed by Fox News, praised the election apparatus at his former place of work. Donald Trump has falsely claimed that Arizona's vote tally was fraudulent after Biden became the first Democrat to win Arizona since Bill Clinton in 1996. Let's watch Steyerwalt's answers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Steyerwalt, I'd like you to explain a term that was thrown around a lot during the election, and that's the so-called red mirage. What does that mean? <clears throat> so, in the 40 or 50 years, let's say, that Americans have increasingly chosen to vote by mail or early or absentee, <clears throat> Democrats prefer that method of voting more than Republicans do. So basically, in every election, Republicans win election day and Democrats win the early vote. And then you wait and start counting, and it depends on which ones you count first, but usually it's election day votes that get counted first and you see the Republicans shoot ahead, and then the process of, of bailing and binding and unbinding all those mail-in votes, uh, and some states like Pennsylvania refuse to count the votes first, so you have to wait for all of that to come in. So in every election, and certainly a national election, you expect to see the Republican with a lead, but it's not really a lead. Um, when you put together a jigsaw puzzle, it doesn't matter which piece you put in first, it ends up with the same image. So for us, who cares? Uh, but that's because no candidate had ever tried to avail themselves of this quirk in the election counting system. We had gone to pains, uh, and I'm proud of the pains we went to, to make sure that we were informing viewers that this was going to happen because the Trump uh, campaign and the president had made it clear that they were going to try to exploit this anomaly, and we knew it was going to be bigger because the percentage of early votes was higher, right? We went from about 45% of the votes being early and absentee to because of the pandemic, that increased by about 50%. So we knew it would be longer, we knew it would be more. So we wanted to keep telling viewers, hey look, the number that you see here is sort of irrelevant because it's only a small percentage of these votes. So this red mirage, that's really what you expected to happen on election night. Happens every time. Thank you, Mr. Steyerwald. Now, I'd like to play a, a clip of Attorney General uh, Bill Barr, who also explains what was expected to happen on election night. Right out of the box on election night, the president uh, claimed that there was major fraud underway. I mean, this happened, as far as I could tell, before there was actually any potential of looking at evidence. And it seemed to be based on the dynamic that uh, that at the end of the evening, a lot of Democratic votes came in, which changed the vote counts in certain states. And that seemed to be the basis for this broad claim that there was major fraud. And I didn't think much of that because people had been talking for weeks and everyone understood for weeks that that was going to be what happened on election night. Mr. Stepien obviously could not be with us today, and it's proper for him to be with his wife as they welcome their child. Uh, but he also had discussions uh, with the president about the red mirage, that is, that it would be a long night and that early votes would favor him, but that lots more votes would be counted over the course of the night and the days after. So let's play uh, clip one from our interview with Mr. Stepien. I, I recounted back to that conversation uh, with him in which I said, just like I said in 2016, it was going to be a long night. Um, I, I told him in 2020 that, um, you know, there were, it was going to be a, a process again um, as, you know, the, the early returns are going to be, you know, positive and we're going to, you know, be watching the returns of, of, of ballots as, you know, they rolled in thereafter. So so is it fair to say you're trying to present a, a re, what you thought would be a realistic picture of what might happen over the course of that night, being election night? That night and the days that followed. Yeah, I, I, uh, I always, uh, I always, you know, I always told 
the president the truth. And, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I think he expected that from me. And, uh, I told him it was going to be a process. It was going to be, um, you know, um, you know, uh, we had to wait and see how this turned out. Um, so I, just like I did in 2016, I did the same thing in 2020. So let's watch a short clip of President Trump speaking after he received that information from his campaign advisors. We want all voting to stop. We don't want them to find any ballots at four o'clock in the morning and add them to the list. So when former President Trump said that, it contradicted what his advisors had warned would happen. We all know that mail-in ballots played an important role in the 2020 election. However, President Trump continuously discouraged mail-in voting. Mr. Stepien was so concerned about the president's position on mail-in voting that in the summer of 2020, he met with President Trump uh, along with House Minority Leader uh, Kevin McCarthy. Let's play clip four. Meeting uh, that was had um, in particular, um, I invited uh, Kevin McCarthy to join the meeting, uh, he being of like mind on, on the issue uh, with me, mm -hmm. um, in which we made our case uh, for, for why we believed mail-in balloting, mail-in voting, um, not to be a bad thing for his campaign. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the president's mind was, was, was made up and he understands, um, you know, how many times to, you know, go to the well on a particular topic. Yeah, I understand. Tell me a little bit more about the argument that you and Mr. McCarthy made to the president in that meeting as to why it wasn't a bad thing that mail-in voting was available? Lar largely two pillars to that argument, both of which I've uh, previously mentioned. One, you know, leaving a good deal to chance, uh, pushing or uh, urging your voters to vote only on election day leaves a lot to chance. Uh, that's, that's A. And B, uh, also previously mentioned, um, the fact that the Trump campaign, the Republican National Committee, the Republican Party had an advantage of, of, of grassroots workers and volunteers on the ground that would allow, um, you know, an, an advantage to enhance return rates of, of ballots that were mailed. Those were the two yeah. the pillars of the argument. I see. And what, if anything, do you recall Representative McCarthy saying during that meeting? We were we were echoing the same argument. I mean, his his words echo, uh, echoed mine and, and vice versa on those on those two topics. Mr. Steyerwalt, you were at the decision desk at Fox News on election night, and you called Arizona early for President Biden, which was controversial. How did you make that call, and where did you think the race stood in the early hours of the next day? Well, it was really controversial to our competitors who we beat so badly by making the correct call first. Uh, our decision desk uh, was the best in the business and I was very proud to be a part of it. Uh, because we had, a, uh, we had partnered with the Associated Press and the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago, uh, thanks to uh, my colleague and friend Arnon Mishkin, uh, had built a wonderful device for forecasting the outcomes of elections. So we had a different set of data than our competitors did. We had more research uh, and we had a better system and we had a great team. Um, so what you're waiting to see is do the actual votes match up with the expectations in the poll? The real votes are testing the quality of your poll in targeted precincts and in targeted places. And let me tell you, our poll in Arizona was beautiful and it was doing just what we wanted it to do and it was cooking up just right. And at some point, and I forget exactly uh, who, but at some point, it became clear that Arizona was getting ready to make a call. So we, around, uh, you know, my boss, Bill Salmon, said we're not making any call until everybody says yes, because that was always our policy, unanimity. And you have to understand, in this room, you have, you know, the, the best. 
people from academia, Democrats, Republicans, a broad cross-section of people who had worked together for a decade, who were really serious about this stuff. So we knew it would be a consequential call because it was one of five states that really mattered, right? Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona were the ones that we were watching. We knew it would be significant to call any one of those five, but we already knew Trump's chances were very small and getting smaller based on what we had seen. So we were able to make the call early. Uh, we were able to beat the competition. Uh, we looked around the room, everybody says yay, and on we go. And by the time we found out how much everybody was freaking out and losing their minds over this call, we were already trying to call the next state. We had already moved on. We were to Georgia, we were to North Carolina, we were looking at these other states. Uh, so we thought it was, we were pleased, but not surprised. I see. You know, after the election, as of November 7th, in your judgment, what were the chances of President Trump winning the election? After that point? Yes. None. I mean, I guess there, you could, you, it's always possible that you could have, you know, uh, a truckload of ballots be found somewhere, I suppose. But once you get into this space, you know, um, ahead of today, I thought about what are the largest margins that could ever be overturned by a recount and the normal kind of, the kind of stuff that we heard Mike Pence talking about sounding like a normal Republican that night when he said, you know, we'll keep every challenge. Nothing like that. In a recount, you're talking about hundreds of votes. When we think about calling a race, one of the things that we would think about is, is it outside the margin of a recount? And when we think about that margin, we think about, in modern history, you're talking about 1,000 votes, 1,500 votes at the way, way outside. Normally, you're talking about hundreds of votes, maybe 300 votes that are going to change. So the idea that through any normal process in any of these states, remember, he had to do it thrice, right? He needed three of these states to change. And in order to do that, I mean, you're at, you're at uh, an infant, you're better off to play the Powerball uh, than to <laughs> have that come in. On November 